We have a great panel this evening. Um, uh, we have a pre-recording of Congressman Jim Costa. He couldn't attend tonight, but uh, I asked him several of the key questions we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, we have Congressman Tom McClintock, McClintock with us this evening as well. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, and we have Tom Knowles, who is retired chief of the FBI International Operations Section. Welcome, Tom. I know we have some uh, audio issues. Hopefully, we can get that worked out. Uh, and then we have Gregory, uh, Reverend Gregory Zubach, uh, St. Mich Michael's Ukrainian Catholic Parish with us uh, from Ukraine. A lot of information on the, on the ground on Ukraine and what, what's going on in that part of the world. Um, okay, so we're going to dive right in. The hot news of the day is uh, the, the president, President Biden's uh, uh, executive order. I don't know if it's an executive order or asking Congress for order to stop buying Russian oil. Uh, we have a brief <clears throat> uh, uh, answer from uh, Congressman Costa, which we're gonna put up right now. And then we're gonna go to uh, Congressman McClintock for his uh, uh, feedback on that. So let's play uh, our um, C3 on, uh, on, on uh, Congressman Costa. What are your thoughts on uh, and the Congress's thoughts on stopping the purchase of Russian oil? Well, I think there's overwhelming bipartisan support again. Uh, we heard the speaker talk about it over the weekend. And I think the, the White House has had that on the table for over a week now. The, the challenge is not us. Uh, we have the ability to, to uh, provide the replacement. The challenge is for our European allies um, and some countries like Italy get 100% of their oil and gas from Russia, uh, others less so, but still significant. And uh, we've got to figure out a way to, uh, with our allies, because it only works if we're in this together, um, on how to make up their lost supply of, of oil and gas. And we're working on that as we speak. Okay, so that was Congressman Costa's basically support of uh, the president. Um, you, you heard his, his comments and his, his issue is his comments were basically, you know, our allies, our European allies are really the big users of Russian oil and it's going to impact them the most. Uh, Congressman McClintock, your uh, comments on Russian oil, stopping the purchase of Russian oil. Well, I, I think that's something very important to do, but there are also some things we need to understand how we got here. Um, during the Trump administration, we were producing about 13 million barrels of oil a day in the United States. Uh, that figure under the Biden administration has dropped to about 11 million. Um, the uh, Keystone pipeline that President Biden canceled on his very first day in office uh, would have brought in about 800, little over 800,000 barrels of Canadian oil a day into American markets. In the last year, our Russian oil imports have tripled from 200,000 to about 600,000 barrels a day. Uh, uh, and at the spot price of what is it, $130 a barrel, uh, that's more than $60 million a day that Americans are putting into the Russian war machine. Now again, compare the 800,000 uh, barrels of Canadian oil that we could have been brought in, bringing in every single day through the Keystone Pipeline with the 600,000 uh, that we've been importing every day from Russia. Uh, this is one of the byproducts of the uh, left's uh, war on fossil fuels. And we've got to get American production back up to the point we had it under the Trump administration when we were literally energy independent for the first time in our lifetimes. And that's a great, uh, great point. Uh, I asked the same question of uh, Congressman Costa and uh, we're gonna put his answer up and that's on C4. So it's uh, coming up right now. Jim, along with those lines, are we, is there any movement in Congress? And I know this is really a White House issue to uh, build or finish out the Keystone pipeline so we can deliver gas and oil to Europe through our, our ports in the Caribbean. Well, I have voted for the Keystone Pipeline four times, I think. Um, and uh, as you know, President Biden put a hold on that uh, last year. 
and whether or not this uh, creates significant pressure to uh, reconsider that is up to the determination of uh, the president. Um, but the whole world has changed in two weeks, to be sure. Obviously, we still have the issues of climate change. We still need to have, I, I think, of anything, this shows how critical it is not to be dependent upon any single source of energy and how we really need to have a robust renewable portfolio, uh, which in California, we're, we're doing. I mean, you know, California, uh, depending on the hydro year, 40% of our energy, fifth largest economy in the world, is renewable. Think about that. Uh, yep. fifth largest economy in the world and 40% of our energy is renewable. And the world's moving in that direction. But clearly this war, I think, is uh, certainly the Germans to cancel Nord Stream 2. Think about that. We had been pushing and pressuring them and the world has changed. Not only did Germany cancel that very important pipeline to them, Nord Stream 2, uh, but they've also uh, now looked at uh, uh, in a short term, uh, whether or not they can initiate some of their nuclear plants that they were mothballing or shutting down. Uh, they've now made a commitment that uh, will meet their 2% and then plus, which will make them the largest contributor to NATO. And um, now uh, for a full uh, uh, turnabout, uh, we see them, um, I mean, the European Union two weeks ago would not have thought about $500 million in military aid to Ukraine and economic aid, it would be unthinkable. And so, um, you know, I think the, the, the world is beginning to really come together. And I, I think the, the world press, certainly our US press, are keeping this on the, on the top burner. And it's so critical, your efforts with GV, Wire and others. I mean, this is about good and evil. That's what this is about. It's about whether or not uh, democratic countries, um, and the United States is that beacon uh, of light for the symbol of what democratic nations uh, stand for. Um, you know, those human rights that are established in our constitution, our freedoms of speech, religion, assembly, press. Uh, and the fact is, is that um, we share that in common with our European allies uh, and other parts with Japan to be engaged. I mean, Japan has a pacifist constitution, and uh, and they and 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 Germany uh, have. I, I mean, I think there really is beginning to be an understanding in this generation, and the one right after that that we these freedoms that we've had for seventy two years should not be taken for granted. So basically, um, you know, the Keystone Pipeline, which has been a, a, a big issue. Uh, Congressman Costa said that he supports, he's voted for it uh, four times, basically, um, which is, which is, you know, Congressman McClintock talked about that. If we, if, you know, if we had, if we, actually, Congressman, can you reiterate what you just said on the first day of President Biden's administration? What, what was the ex exact executive order? Yeah, uh, the very first day, inauguration day, he issued an executive order canceling construction of the Keystone Pipeline. That threw tens of thousands of American workers out of work, but it also cost us the ability to import about 800,000 barrels a day of Canadian oil into American markets. Uh, and again, compare that to the 600,000 barrels of Russian oil that we are now importing daily into the United States, a threefold increase in the last year. I mean, the, the oil's got to come from someplace. It used to come from America. Now it's coming from places like Russia. The administration's now negotiating with our enemies in Venezuela and Iran to increase uh, oil imports. Yet think about it, at the State of the Union address, he said we needed to, to buy more American. He means everything except uh, oil production. And, and the tragedy there is America is a petroleum giant compared to Saudi Arabia uh, or Russia, but we have place such restrictions on our ability to prosper from our own natural resources that we're having to import this now and rely on America's enemies to uh, uh, fuel our economy. That is insane. That's a great point. Uh, I know there was, uh, welcome Mike, I'm gonna get to you in a second. Uh, I know that there is a conversation over the weekend on, on a lot of the media sources, including uh, Fareed Zakaria, GPS, about you know, Russia produces about roughly 10 million barrels of oil a day, and we can easily replace that. 
and say the West is not going to buy anything from Russia if Venezuela, which is at uh, I think three million barrel, has the capacity. And if you can go to slide five, uh, uh, Venezuela, which has three million barrels a day and capacity, uh, if if uh, we would go back and actually start removing those sanctions on them, if the Iran nuclear deal was put together, which produces four and a half million barrels a day, and if Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and some of the other Gulf states would in, in, in increase production of oil so we can get replace the 10 million barrels coming out of Russia with all these other states. Yeah, some of them are, you know, we've had sanctions on. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Congressman? So, so that- Well, again, you know, it, it's, it's yeah. self-destructive and, and bordering on insanity. Iran is reported to be uh, uh, very close to developing uh, a nuclear capability. Uh, they are the leading uh, uh, exporter of terrorism in the world today. And we're gonna be buying, what did you say, 4 million barrels of oil a day from them? Yeah, at over $100 a, a barrel? What are these people thinking, especially when we have the capability within the United States to meet our needs? We were doing that under the Trump administration. As I said, we are producing 13 million barrels a day. Uh, it's down to 11. We should be up at about 15 million. We certainly have the resources. Why aren't we developing American energy resources? Yeah, so, and I'm gonna to get to Mike and then Steve, but so the, the conversation is, uh, so we only, I think, import 900,000, but yeah, like, as you said, being four, four and 800,000 barrels a day uh, from Russia, but the, and the rest of the world, mainly Europe, imports you know the balance of the russian production russia is basically a big gas station uh gas station of the world majority well it's not majority maybe between 30 and 40 percent of the, their revenue is from just oil that's what's published uh if there was enough supply from other places including venezuela and iran saudi arabia and kuwait uh then the world would not need russian oil and their economy would collapse basically in the matter of days or weeks. Would you support that? Or would you say, no, we should not deal with them with Venezuela, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and uh, you know, Kuwait production? Well, it's complicated by the fact that this is a world market. So oil is fungible, it's a commodity. Um, uh, this is gonna hurt Russia, but it's not gonna shut off their, their sales. The thing that'll hurt them the most, and in fact, I saw an interview recently with somebody who was on a, who appeared with Putin a few years back talking about American fracking and our, our natural gas production. Putin went absolutely ballistic. And the reason was he understood if America actually developed our potential, uh, we would be reducing the uh, uh, price of oil in all markets, which would be hurt, hurting Putin and his regime that depends so heavily on oil exports uh, for their funding. Um, you know, it's not complicated. When something is plentiful, it's cheap. When it's, scare, uh, when it's scarce, it becomes very expensive. Uh, when we were producing abundant American energy, we were paying uh, the uh, lowest prices for, um, uh, for gasoline in many, many years, the lowest prices for crude oil in many years. Uh, it's when this administration took office and started shutting down American energy production where well, we saw the price increase 40% at the pump uh, before any of, of, of the Ukrainian invasion had begun. That, that was strictly supply and demand. You want to reduce his profits, you want to reduce the, the profits of, of terrorist exporters like Iran, produce American energy, flood the market with it, bring down the price. And Robert Wharton, before I go to Mike, uh, had the same comment. We should be overproducing to make oil cheap uh, to take the funds away from all of them and, and enrich our economy until we get, re and I'm going to add, until we get renewables in place, which is going to, you know, to supply enough of our energy, uh, we're going to need uh, oil to take care of our immediate needs. Um, well, don't, don't forget also the renewals, the renewables, if you're talking about wind and solar, are very, very expensive. Uh, solar, solar volatilic is about the most expensive way we've yet invented. Uh, to uh, create electricity. It requires a huge amount of backup reserve because these are intermittent supplies, both uh, solar and wind. You have to have a reliable base supply standing by online, which usually means spinning gas turbines at ready reserve 
uh, in case the uh, a cloud passes over a solar array or the wind falls off. And then you need separate transmission systems for wind and solar. So you're talking about an extremely expensive arrangement. Uh, this is part of the green ideology. And the only problem is it doesn't work in real life. Uh, uh, the, the Europeans have discovered that and are moving back to conventional fuels. Uh, so at some point you have to, you have to engage the, the simple reality of economics in making these decisions. And unfortunately, the green ideology has no place for reason or economics. Okay, who, okay. whoever is not speaking, please put your phone on mute because we can hear you uh, the vibrate. Okay. Let me Darius, go. Darius, I'd like to jump in real quick. Okay, and then, then we're going to, uh, Mike, go. did you have a quick question real quick? And then we're going to jump to Steve. Go ahead, Steve. I'll go after you. Have a, okay. okay. So I agree with Congressman McClintock on uh, these points that he has just made. I'm going to give you a local example. Today, we had a, a legislative update from Sacramento. We have it once a year. Our lobbyists come to Fresno County. It was in our board meeting today. We talked about all the bills in front of um, the legislature that could impact Fresno County. One of those bills is a, um, a requirement that CalPERS and CalSTRS disinvest from oil and natural gas investments. So that's our big um, retirement programs in the state of California for all that all California employees put into, you know, they invest in mutual funds. And now there is a bill being moved forward in California that those funds cannot be invested in oil and natural gas. There is a war on oil and natural gas in crazy places like California, where there's some fairy dust committal to renewables that is not happening, by the way. I would love to have Michael uh, Sellenbacher, uh, Sellenberg on the program. He's, he's a green energy expert and he's completely turned his back on renewables. It's not happening. It's not happening for Germany. And on the streets of Kiev, we have an old school fight over oil production and the delivery of oil. I agree with Congressman McClintock. It's time for us to get real about what's happening in our world in regards to energy and oil production. In California, as you know, Darius, we've talked about it on Unfiltered. The more solar we put in, the more our energy bills go up. And somebody needs to come on and explain that because that's the reality that we're facing. So I agree that we should be 100% oil independent. And then we should let these other countries, we should uh, produce enough oil to benefit other countries and, and drop the overall worldwide price of a, a barrel of crude. And Mike, as you're addressing that, uh, didn't California just pass a law or, or was a CPUC that says all homes that have solar production have got to pay a tax? As like, uh, was it $50 a month or some number like that, that California uh, solar pro uh, producers uh, on residential have got to pay some kind of a tax. I think we had a uh, GV Wire has had an article on that uh, a while back. I don't know if Mike, you can elaborate on that or not. But, and, and by the way, Inga uh, Schlegel has got a great comment too. Even Elon Musk wants us to drill. <laughs> so, Mike. Yeah, well, look, uh, it doesn't surprise me. This is California. Any chance in the middle of inflation to tax people and burden them? You know, that's, that's unfortunately poor thinking. Um, and we have to do something about that. But I want to go back to this issue of we've compared the current crisis today and Putin's aggression to Hitler and, and going into the Rhineland and Poland. There's another thing that happened today that shocked the heck out of me. I read in the Wall Street Journal that the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and Sheikh Mohammed of the UAE both refused to meet with our president. They met last week over the phone with Vladimir Putin. But now they're refusing to talk to our president. And when there's, they're, they're, they're trying to get us involved in the Yemen crisis right now. Now, when the 1973 oil embargo happened, there's another correlation. It had to do with Yom Kippur War and the issues between Egypt and, and Israel when the Arab nations embargoed us. Maybe this is why we need more domestic production. But I, I just, on the geopolitical scene, it just shocks the heck out of me to read that. And I wanted to hear Congressman McClintock's uh, thoughts on that. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And, and again, it's, it's so needless. These are self-inflicted wounds. We have the energy. We just refuse to develop it. You know, to Steve's point, 35 years ago, California ranked second in the nation in oil production. Uh, in those intervening years, 
U.S. production has gone up 140% in the last decade. California's production has dropped 60% in the same period. So in the last decade, while American production increased 140%, California production dropped 60%. Um, as our nation's grown uh, under the Trump administration, we had grown independent of foreign oil. We discovered new reserves. We developed the technology to harvest them. Meanwhile, California's dependence on foreign oil grew dramatically and, and, and dangerously. In 2000, California produced 50% of the oil it consumed. Today, it produces just 30%. California's dependence on foreign imports has grown from 25% to 60%. And the irony is uh, we have uh, the, one of the largest oil fields in the country here in California. So much of the uh, American energy production right now is going on at the Permian Basin in Texas and the Bakken uh, uh, Basin in, um, in South Dakota. The Monterey Basin is much bigger, but it's completely off limits to develop. Yeah, and LA just banned, uh, wasn't LA County banned any drilling or production of oil uh, a few weeks back? Steve, were you up to speed on that? LA County, it was LA yeah, County. Absolutely, well, there, there, there are a lot of crazy wackos in California and that's why you see a lot of people with common sense getting out of the state of California. But I don't wanna go into that right now. It's another thing we talked about a lot, but we're getting a lesson retaught to us in global economics over oil that we knew instinctively when we were in kindergarten. But now it takes something like what's happening in Russia and Ukraine for us to remember what are the realities of the world. And I think going forward, you know, we have to learn a big lesson. And I'm very interested to know if our current president is willing or capable of learning that lesson and reversing some of the terrible decisions like shutting down the Keystone Pipeline. Now, Darius, before uh, Congressman McClintock checks off, I'd like to ask another question on a part of the Ukraine-Russian conflict. Um, um, and that is, and this is one thing we wanna ask all of the congressmen that come on and talk to us here locally on Unfiltered, we're very thankful of that is, Congressman, you know, how far do you think is our obligation on this war between Russia and the Ukraine? I mean, does it stop at weapons? Do you, do you foresee sending troops? What are your thoughts? Uh, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, first, let's get back to some principles that we abandoned about 70 years ago to our regret, but they used to guide our foreign policy. Number one, only Congress declares war. That's a constitutional provision. Uh, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, said he thought it was the single most important provision. Uh, the president cannot commit troops uh, without congressional authorization, unless it's purely defensive. Uh, secondly, we've only attacked other countries when they attack us. And thirdly, when we do, we put all of our resources behind it and get it over with just as quickly as possible. That's the way we conducted ourselves until the end of World War II. We abandoned those principles to our regret. In the past, when we have uh, faced a potential foe, we've surrounded it with superior power uh, and waited them out. With respect to the attack on Ukraine, right now that is not yet an American security issue. It is a European security issue. Um, but it has the potential of becoming an American security issue. Uh, I think that gives us not only the st strategic responsibility, but also the moral responsibility, given the barbarity of what is going on there under Putin, to be sure that Ukrainians uh, have every possible weapon uh, at their disposal. Uh, that can be done without creating a constant spell eye uh, that would bring us into a war with Russia. Um, uh, and also, we need to do everything we can through financial markets and others to, to uh, cripple the Russian economy. I think we are well on our way to doing both. Um, we do have to pull back from all of the barbarity that we're, we're watching the, the, the Russians commit though, and realize that we are facing a, a set of global issues. Uh, China, Iran, North Korea, uh, and many other rogue states and bad actors would like nothing more to see the United States entangled in a war with Russia. Uh, at that point, you begin to see things unravel very, very quickly. I think we need to be very, very careful about that as we approach this. So provide them with whatever armaments uh, they need to, to repel the Russians. 
uh, and do everything we can to collapse their economy. Uh, that can be done without drawing us into an actual war with a nuclear power. Uh, particularly in this unstable situation that we're facing today, I think that's critically important. One other thought. At the end of World War II, we had exhausted all of our resources. I was reading the transcript from the Senate Finance Committee in 1945, uh, March of 1945. It was a, a measure to increase the debt limit. The senators were desperately concerned with the amount of debt that had been incurred as we fought World War II. Now, again, remember, this is at the end of World War II. They were concerned we may not have the resources to continue the war into 1946, given the enormous and unprecedented debt level that we had to incur to get through that war. And again, this was two months before Germany surrendered. Um, we are already carrying a heavier debt burden right now relative to GDP than we were carrying that day in 1945 after we'd exhausted our resources fighting World War II. I am seriously concerned if we don't get our finances back under control fast, uh, if we are confronted with the kind of global uh, attack that we suffered in 1941, I'm concerned whether we have the resources uh, to prevail. Uh, uh, and that ought to be concerning every American. Uh, great because point. before you can provide for the common defense, yeah. you have to be able to pay for it. In history, warns us that countries that bankrupt themselves aren't around very long. Great points, Congress. And before I get to Mike, uh, several comments have come up on Facebook, uh, one from Robert Wharton and similar one from Susan Wittrup. What about our promise uh, uh, to back up Ukraine after they handed over their nuclear weapons in 1994, the Budapest Treaty? Yes, and Robert Wharton's question actually rephrased, is USA's worth, worth, worth anything when they promise to provide protection you know, when Ukraine gave up its nuke. So we told Ukraine, UK, US, and Russia, so you give up your, all your nuclear missiles, the third largest stockpile in the world, and in return, we'll respect your sovereignty and make sure you have protection. Okay, to be clear, no, we, the United States, didn't do that. Bill Clinton did that as an executive agreement. Constitution does not recognize executive agreements. Constitution recognizes treaties that are ratified by the Senate. NATO is a treaty that gives us an ironclad commitment, a legal commitment to defend a NATO country that's attacked as if it was an attack on our own country. The executive agreement, the Budapest resolution that you referenced, uh, was no treaty. It was simply uh, uh, an executive promise uh, by Bill Clinton with no constitutional authority to make that promise. It is not binding. Got it. So, so shame on the Ukrainians. Basically, they, they shouldn't have followed our lead to say, hey, uh, uh, they, 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 we know well, we should send them an think, think about it, Think about what could happen to this country if yeah. any president at any time could enter a treaty that would draw us into a war. That would be a very, very dangerous place to be. That's a great point, Congressman. We should probably at, tell the world, hey, at, uh, the things that we sign. Uh, if unless it's ratified by Congress, you know what? It's just a wink, basically. Uh, but no, Darius, we, yeah. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. And that goes for what Congressman McClintock said in his opening argument, his op opening point was, and that is also true when it comes to going to war. We need, we are not in the superior moral position that we've been in previously. And right now we need to clear the air on some of these things. Our president is not supposed to take us into war. And when I read the reports and, and all of the of false propaganda that's um, pertaining to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, you know, I see a lot of people still angling for war. It's very dangerous. I think we could easily get in over our heads. We need to think of all of the geopolitical ramifications. We need to consider India, China, some of these, uh, you know, them dumping the United States dollar as the current as the go-to currency. Congressman just talked about getting our economy correct. So you're right, Darius, and I think that's a great point. I didn't even remember that, Congressman, about that agreement with the Ukraine. But if Clinton did that, apart from Congress, it's a nothing burger. And people do need to learn. People and, need to remember how this really works. And and I think well, North Korea knows that really well. That's why over the last decade they haven't been willing to give up their nukes. Because they go, hey, we know the minute we get give up our nukes that we could be attacked. 
there's several questions um, on on uh, on, uh, on on our feed. Uh, Susan Wittrop has another question. A president's word should mean more. That's true, but if it's unless it's ratified by Congress, I guess it doesn't mean. I don't want to use the word shit, but it doesn't mean a whole lot. Congressman, question for you. The, the, I, the I, Constitution I, binds. The Constitution binds the president. Of uh, uh, he cannot exceed his authority under the Constitution. If he does, it's null and void. That's what happens. That's a good point, Mike. Before, uh, uh, before I go to get to Mike, you a week ago on an interview with GB Wire, you said that we shouldn't get involved uh, in Ukraine, and that's really their war. Uh, how is your position different today than from a, a, a week ago? I think you made similar comments on KC24 with, with your right. interview with them. Well, the, 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 the barbarity of the attack, I, I, I think, makes all of us a, 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 a focus on the, the, the nature of, of the current regime in Russia. Um, but I, I've not wavered from my opinion that we need to uh, avoid a direct war with Russia uh, uh, is, in, in, unless it becomes a, an American security issue, unless we are actually attacked. Again, I think we uh, can and should and are uh, providing uh, uh, the ammunition, the equipment, the munitions uh, that uh, the Ukrainians need. And I think that the, the heroism and resilience uh, that we have seen from the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian military, and the Ukrainian leadership um, uh, has surprised the world. Uh, if they're properly supplied, uh, I think Putin's got a very, very big problem. And I suspect that at some time in the near future, uh, it's been what now, 13 days. They were supposed to, according to our General Milley, they were supposed to roll into Kiev in three days. Um, Russia has at some point, the as the Russian economy buckles, as the Russian invasion stalls uh, because of the heroism of the Ukrainian people fighting for their liberty, um, uh, I think we could see the, 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 the current, uh, Putin and, and, and the current group crop of, um, of his henchmen uh, deposed, and at some point they have to be brought to um, they, they, they have to be brought to an international tribunal. This this attack on Ukraine is a war crime. Uh, Putin and his henchmen are war criminals. Um, bringing them to justice is going to require a change of regime in Russia. But that could happen uh, if the Ukrainian people fight on and are properly supplied by the West. Good point. Before I go to Mike, uh, I think uh, the British said the same thing, right? Right, and the French. Hey, uh, we let Hitler take on Poland and Czechoslovakia. So long as he doesn't come after us, we're okay. Aren't you concerned that Ukraine may be step one? Belarus, which is really a Russian uh, ally, could be step two. Poland could be step three. Yes. And, and, and what message do we send to China if we just sit on the sidelines? And by the way, we talked about this a, a few weeks ago. U.S. Uh, military or defense spending is seven hundred billion, over seven hundred billion. If we're not going to use it. To make sure, you know, you call about terrorist nations. I think what uh, Putin is doing is, is, is terrorist activity. If we're not going to use some of that money, uh, at least to give all the armament months ago to Ukraine to defend themselves, they what 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 we see is here they need helmets, jackets, bulletproof jackets. They need stingers, which now we're giving them. I guess there's a bunch of stinger missiles and javelin missiles, and we'll show a bunch of uh, uh, shots of that on our, on our screen. Uh, but is it, do, do, shouldn't we be spending billions of dollars now so that we don't have to spend tens of billions of dollars down the road going to rebuild, fix, and defend other nations and our own yes. uh, democracy? Well, uh, again, Darius, I, I think that's uh, uh, what we are doing. Um, we've already transferred about a billion dollars worth of, uh, uh, of military equipment to the Ukrainians, uh, it looks like we're going to have about $10 billion authorized and appropriated very soon within the next few days for the same purpose. Uh, as I've been saying all along, uh, I believe that we have every uh, uh, moral and uh, right and, and strategic responsibility to be sure Ukraine has the, uh, Ukraine has the arms that they need. That includes their military, 
their volunteer force, and if necessary, their underground resistance. But if they continue to hold the line as they have, uh, we could watch Russia buckle very quickly. My, and, and by the way, if that happens, that's going to be a very important lesson to China uh, and uh, Iran and other rogue countries uh, to, be, um, <laughs> to, to, to rethink their next move. Uh, but if we are embroiled in a in, entangled in a major war with a nuclear power, um, what happens around the rest of the world, I think, is, is going to unravel very rapidly. That's why, again, we can't be just thumping our chests and, and uh, uh, you know, the old saying goes, so fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Uh, we, can't be, we can't be reckless as we approach what is the most potentially explosive period of world history uh, in our lifetimes. Before we go to uh, Tom Knowles of our, of our retired FBI International Operations Section, uh, I'm going to go to um, Mike, Mike Carbasi. And by the way, the some of the videos you've been seeing uh, on the screen is from Javelin missiles, taking out tanks and a, of Stinger missiles. So those of you that have any questions, and we'll keep on playing those on the show uh, as we go through. So Mike, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Darius. Uh, so I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation uh, so far. And I, you know, I, I'm actually grateful the congressman talked about a deficit because it's something that we talked about really early when we started unfiltered and it was sad because we couldn't get any traction on that just the massive government spending we've had uh, on both sides for a long time one thing bill clinton did do in spite of congress was pass balanced budgets and rein in government spending and unfortunately that hard work by bringing our country back in the middle by creating welfare to work was undone by uh, not to contradict the congressman but one war we did fight uh, that congress approved where a country didn't attack us, and that was the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Now, Saddam Hussein's an evil human being. I have no love for that tyrant. But that cost of that war, in addition to American lives, was generations and generations of inherited deficits that we're never going to be able, well, we're not going to be able to repay. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate now the concern, well, we don't want to fight in Ukraine uh, because it'll cost money. But the precedent has been set. That's no longer an issue. Um, what I'd like to really find out is if NATO decides to take military action against Mr. Putin, if, it co if the president comes to Congress and says, I need authorization to commit our troops to fight in Ukraine, to hold the line, because we see what's happening, will the congressman vote to authorize that? If, if a NATO country is attacked, uh, then we have treaty obligations. We have to be. But if a NATO country is not attacked, we're not attacked. The right. answer at this juncture is no. Right. Uh, as you correctly pointed out, we abandoned those principles in Iraq and other adventures that cost us dearly. And it wasn't just the fact we attacked a country that hadn't attacked us. We also never put our full might and fury behind it to get it over with just as quickly as possible. We defeated the two most powerful military forces on the planet in World War II in three and a half years. And yet we piddled around in Afghanistan and Iraq for 20 years uh, culminating in the humiliating uh, unconditional surrender to the Taliban, turned over $85 billion of American military equipment to the very people who sponsored the attack uh, on 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, let us get back to those principles. Uh, they, they served us well when we abided by them, uh, when we abandoned them. Thank, thank you for uh, mentioning nothing that. But damage. Let me yeah. mention one other point, because you, know, you mentioned the deficit and um, uh, and, and, you know, the trillion dollars or so that we spent uh, uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, more than a trillion. Let me give you three numbers real quick so you'll understand what the problem is in very simple terms. 27, 58, and 89. 27, 58, 89. In the last 10 years, inflation and population combined have grown 27%. Our revenues in the same period have grown 58%. So they're growing roughly twice as fast as inflation and population combined. And by the way, that's after the Trump tax cuts a few years ago. The, the, what's killing us is that third number, 89% is the increase in spending at the same time. When we cut taxes, the impact on the economy was so positive, we didn't lose revenue. We actually brought in more revenue after the tax cuts than we had been getting before because the economy took off like a bat out of hell. We had the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, the lowest poverty rate in 60 years, 
fastest job growth in 40 years. But the deficit continued to grow, not because of any lack of revenue, but because of, of massive spending beyond our means. And that is, that is uh, uh, you remember Admiral Mike Mullen, the, uh, the former chief of, um, uh, of the uh, armed forces. Um, he, uh, he said that in his professional military judgment, the greatest threat facing our country was the national debt. The national debt at the time he said it was about $10 trillion. It's over $30 trillion now. That's the problem. And we've got to get that, that under control or we are not going to be able to meet the next global th uh, 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 threat um, successfully. I'm gonna- uh, That's I'm terrible, gonna go to thank you for mentioning that, Congressman. I'm gonna go to Tom Knowles. I know we have some, uh, Tom has some audio difficulties, so we may not be able to show uh, Tom's uh, video feed, but Tom, let me get your perspective on uh, Ukraine um, and what you can share with us of what you know is happening in that part of the world and your experience as you were stationed in Greece uh, for many years. Let's, let's try the audio, see if it works. And if it doesn't, we'll go to uh, Reverend Gregory. Okay, sounds like we don't have any audio from Tom. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, then switch over to Reverend. Reverend, uh, you've, you've been listening uh, for a while about all the stuff that uh, we should and shouldn't be doing and could be doing. And so give us your perspective on the delivery of the Stinger and Javelin missiles. Uh, you have, and, and when was the last time you talked to folks in, inside Ukraine? And what is the feedback from folks? I know over a million people have, are refugees are leaving Ukraine now going into Poland. Uh, so give, give us again, your perspective on what you're hearing on the ground in Ukraine and also uh, your reaction uh, to the military aid that's going. I think in, in January, we started with $60 million and we have a slide that we can put up. Uh, and now the numbers are, the dollar amounts are moving up to several hundred million dollars and, and more to come. Is that a lot of money? Is that just a drop? I don't know how many missiles uh, 60, uh, 60 million dollars can buy. Maybe it's six of them. I don't know. <laughs> well, it, well, it depends what kind of ordinance you're talking about. I mean, a Stinger missile costs about $22,000 per shot. And a, uh, and uh, the Javelin is about $30,000 per shot. So you can buy a lot. Um, a lot of them were distributed in uh, December and January. So this was before uh, all of the uh, the war got hot in uh, Ukraine. So they were well distributed and they were well protected. Um, they do have lots of access. They've had a lot of hits in the last 24 hours. Uh, there's been a number of planes that were downed. Um, and the uh, the javelins are also extremely effective. Um, they did, they were able to take back uh, in uh, uh, one of the airports recently using javelin uh, missiles. So that it's been very effective. The, the weapons are getting there. Um, on the Polish border, they've been receiving arms. They were getting about three to four shipments per day about a week ago. Now we're seeing about 14 uh, C-17s landing uh, with ordnance coming from various countries. So we're doing very well logistically and the weapons are getting there. Uh, that having been said, the, uh, you know, the, the challenge, of course, is getting them to the front too, because it's a long way from the Polish border all the way to Kiev. And uh, they're actually putting them into trunks of cars right now to transport them. So they're putting them in ordinary vehicles and uh, they're using uh, trunk transport to get them to the front. Okay. What do you hear from you uh, inside Ukraine? Any family or friends that you have? Uh, and what city do they, do they live in? And, and is, it, is the bombardment happening by Russian Air Force? Are we taking out some of their Air Force stuff that we just don't hear in the news here? What can you, there, what can you share with us? Yeah, there's been a fair amount of success with the air warfare. Um, there's been a lot of abandoned vehicles recovered. Uh, a lot of Russians are running away. The, uh, many of the Russians were forced to come there. They, some of the prisoners of war have been testifying that um, they had no idea where they were going. They thought it was an exercise. They had basically a weekend of military training. There's kindergarten teachers and art teachers. 
and, and um, individuals with literally no combat experience that they put on the front, probably as cannon fodder. And they're, they're abandoning their equipment. They're running away. They don't want to fight. They're, they're not soldiers at heart. Um, so as a result, we're seeing a lot of defections, um, very easy to take prisoners of war. Uh, Ukrainians are repurposing a lot of Russian military equipment right now, and, uh, and they're putting it to good use. So uh, in terms of what's happening there, uh, humanitarian point of view, um, there, were, there were a number of rapes that happened out in, in the east. Uh, I believe there's about 11 or 12 reported cases of uh, Russians uh, raping women, and there were some deaths in connection with that. So the people are, are angry, um, and there's a lot of hatred uh, out there right now uh, towards the occupiers. Um, they're very frequently identifying them as orcs uh, at, from along the lines of the Lord of the Rings because that's just the, just the sense that they have for, towards them. But we're also seeing a lot of fighters joining. Uh, we had a sniper join from Sweden. We had medics coming in from Lebanon. Yeah. Um, uh, Georgia has sent a huge contingent. They're already at the front. Uh, we've got Scottish uh, 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 veterans coming to join the fight. And uh, people are, are really flooding in in the International Brigade right now. So uh, it's, it's, uh, that's good. That's things are, are, are looking up for Ukraine. Yeah, that's good to hear. I'm going to... Uh... Uh, kind of what you said reminded me of the Serbian war and the genocide uh, that happened when, when Yugoslavia broke up and so many uh, folks, um, men, I mean, many women and children got raped and killed in front of their husbands by a lot of Serbian forces. That was, uh, and, and also I, Ru Russian backed at the time. And yeah, then my, got, my wife came from Serbia back in, in 1995 and she remembers the war and she's reliving it as she's seeing all the footage right now. It's really opening up some old wounds uh that oh. she's got uh, and, and it's it's uh, it's been a, a tough time emotionally for her to deal with it uh but she's remembering this okay. and and uh and it's uh, the, the uh, there's a lot of similarities so uh before i get to get to a question by the way i i have to give credit uh president clinton uh engaged uh us b2 bombers uh three weeks of uh stealth bombing on serbian sources before that war, that genocide came to an end. So, so many uh, uh, European countries after the second war said, never again are we going to allow genocide to take place on European continent after the, you know, massacre and the genocide and, and that, that took place by Hitler and, and the Holocaust. Uh, but then they stood on the sidelines as, uh, you know, the war in Serbia took on and Serbians just went on this massive rampage against so many other neighbors, including a lot of Muslim uh, um, Bosnians, et cetera. And again, if it wasn't for, for U.S. B-2 bombers ordered by President Clinton, uh, there, there'd be many, many more deaths. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, the question that, that came up uh, from Inga, uh, do you, Reverend, do you have any hopes for negotiations? Well, you can't negotiate with liars. Um, and you can assume that everything you're going to hear from the Russian delegation is going to be dishonest half-truths, lies, misrepresentations, promises they intend to break. You can't negotiate in good faith with people who won't negotiate in good faith. So that's going to be the challenge that uh, they're going to be facing. Um, right now, they're pressing for, uh, for peace, uh, uh, at least for some of the terms. Uh, but uh, the question is, is there going to be justice? Because you're just going to have a false peace if you don't have justice with peace. You have, to have, uh, you have to have justice and peace combining together to have a true and lasting peace. So it's going to be very difficult to negotiate with individuals like that. That's a good point. Uh, several of the comments that I had heard over the weekend. Oh, oh, excuse me. Guys, uh, we have interference. We have, okay, so um, several of the comments that we had heard uh, over the weekend, uh, I had heard over the weekend is that uh, President Trump was actually the first, uh, and we have a slide to put up on that, slide 21, uh, was the first uh, that actually withheld $400 million in military aid to Ukraine, which eventually led to his impeachment in the, in the House. Oh, no, 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 Darius, Darius, just a moment here. I was okay. on the Judiciary Committee that heard that, I'm pretty well informed. So tell us, tell us about that. The law that, uh, really, that first of all, it was Trump administration re requested lethal aid for Ukraine. Uh, the Obama administration had refused to offer, we were sending them blankets and, and MRE rations. Uh, it was the Trump administration that actually sent lethal aid to Ukraine. But in the law that authorized that transfer, 
the president was required to first certify uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the Ukrainian government uh, was taking steps to combat corruption. Uh, and we can go into that in great detail if you'd like. Uh, but uh, the fact is the president had a responsibility uh, to, uh, under the law to certify that they were um, uh, uh, combating corruption. And that included corrupt dealings uh, with, um, with Hunter Biden and the um, uh, money that was being transferred uh, to Biden, uh, to, to Hunter Biden. And now we have email traffic that makes it clear that was actually, some of that was ending up in the big guy's uh, pocket. Uh, the president uh, had a responsibility under law to make those certifications. He ultimately re uh, made the certification and released that lethal aid. And that's why the Ukrainian uh, military has the, had the Javelin uh, missiles at the outset of this conflict. Got it. Uh, so we're going to come back. Uh, right now, we're going to put up a video. Same question uh, I asked uh, Congressman Costa uh, about you know, military aid. And we, uh, let's... Uh, uh, a few years ago, and we're going to hear his response next. The $10 billion that the administration is requesting, uh, how fast do you think that he may? Uh, jet aircraft and helicopters. Uh, that's, that's continuing as we speak. Did, did, and did we, was there a reason why we didn't send military aid earlier? And I know during the uh, Trump administration, there was a $400 million aid package that was withheld for a period of time. Is there a reason we did It was withheld for political ransom and the president got yeah. impeached on it. <laughs> Let's be clear. Uh, right. It was an hour long telephone conversation or as President Trump indicated, a perfect phone call. Uh, and uh, he was willing to leverage the Ukrainian president uh, for dirt on his political opponent. Uh, and he withheld $400 million in aid. Uh, but we've been providing uh, last year, and it really intensified as Russia's motivations in terms of our intelligence. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so basically, uh, Congressman Costa said uh, that that is what led to uh, President Trump's impeachment of, of, over a one hour conversation. Um, with the Ukrainians, uh, di different perspective from Congressman McClintock and Cong uh, Congressman Costa. I wish uh, uh, Co Congressman Costa would be here tonight live so we can actually have a more robust debate. We are gonna invite Congressman Costa back again uh, next week or the following week. And hopefully Congressman McClintock will be available as well to kind of uh, address that issue here live on, on GV Wire. Uh, we probably want to go into the entire Burisma dealings with Biden and his son, but we'll save that for another day. Okay, that could be a just show show just just by itself. Okay, uh, Mike. So you know, I actually am curious about that because the the, the 1974 Impound Control Act says the president can't withhold funds uh, that Congress has appropriated. It's another power that Congress has over the president, but the the De Department of Defense did authorize that. Ukraine had committed, uh, made made progress on anti-corruption. Now I know the the whole Hunter Biden Biden thing is being made a part of it, but you know it looks like the Defense Department did authorize it, and then there was some kind of political gamesmanship. I mean, I'm not trying to. I don't care about red and blue. I'm trying to find out the, what the going Defense on. Department isn't the executive power. The executive power is the president. Uh, the president, uh, all executive powers, uh, flow from the president. Uh, uh, so there's, there's no independent executive agency. Uh, uh, the executive power, our Article 2 of the Constitution says very clearly, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. Uh, and when Congress authorized those funds, it instructed the executive, the president, to certify uh, that the Ukrainian government was making, taking steps to combat corruption before he released uh, those armaments. He ultimately made that uh, determination. The armaments were released. As I said, that's why the Ukrainian military had javelin missiles at the beginning of this uh, of this invasion. But the Defense Department works for the president, Congressman. Correct. I'm trying to understand, and it looks like the power was in the hands of Congress. Now you're saying that with this specific uh, appropriation, that Congress directed the, the president to right. determine 
of, of, of whether the Ukrainian government was taking the steps necessary to combat corruption within its ranks. Got it. Okay. Thank you. We're almost uh, uh, almost out of time. Uh, I want to see if there's any other comments uh, from our uh, hey, Darius audience and Reverend. Darius, I'd like to say, you know, it, it's one thing in the political atmosphere right now, everybody's looking for somebody to blame. A Democrat could easily blame uh, former President Trump. Uh, a conservative like me might say, you know, that they're picking on Biden. But, uh, you know, we have our pastor here tonight. Let's give a little historical context, right? I mean, Putin has wanted the Ukraine for well beyond Trump's time. Donald Trump, was uh, doing a show from New York, uh, you know, um, um, firing people on air, okay, when Putin wanted Ukraine. So the problems predate President Biden and President Trump. And the Ukraine and Western Europe, NATO, had plenty of time to prepare, but they did not do that. And that's why we're in the spot we're in today. It's nothing that happened in the last 24 months. I mean, we could make, you know, the case that, that all of these things weigh in, but NATO, Western Europe was not prepared. And we spend $715 billion a year annually to help them get prepared. And none of that happened. And so that's why we're in the mess we're in today. It's going to take some real smart thinking to get us out of this mess, in my opinion. Let's be fair, Steve. You're right. Absolutely right. The question is, are we going to do something about it? Are we going to come together as a country and fight and defend a democracy or allow it to fall under the sphere of influence of the, of the Russians? Mike, are you talking about putting boots on the ground in? Are you prepared to say that you want to put boots on the ground in the Ukraine? I'm not there. So yeah, you know, it, I think we need the Europeans to maybe lead. If that's what is to be done, maybe that should be Germany, France, so, maybe some of these NATO countries over here. Right. So it's really hard to just say that and commit our troops to something because, look, I, I don't I don't wear the uniform and I have a lot of respect for people that do that and their families. Um, I'm curious to see what, fa what, what Father Gregory is going to say about that. But here's my thing. If the NATO countries step up and say, hey, we as NATO countries want to defend Ukraine, I think it's incumbent upon us to join them and, and follow through with that commitment. I, you know, there's a million chances we could have said, you know, with Crimea or other things. No, stop it. We're not going to let you keep pushing through because what's happening now is. Other groups like oh, potentially OPEC or some of the Arab countries are going to use this to leverage for 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 the Yemen war. I'm worried what China is going to do related to, to Taiwan. So before this gets even worse, at some point we're going to have to act. Um, Father Gregory, what are your thoughts? You know, listen. There's a big worry about boots on the ground. Zelensky made it very clear he's not asking for soldiers. He's not asking for any boots on the ground. He needs weapons. That's what he's asking for, and he's not getting enough of what he needs. And I'm talking about aircraft. I'm talking about anti-aircraft batteries. That's what we're talking about here. I mean, the javelins and the, the stingers, they're, they're what you call a poor man's weapon. It's a way of leveling the playing field. Uh, when you've got a David versus Goliath situation, it worked in Afghanistan and it can work here, but we need more weapons in Ukraine. He's not asking for any troops. He never did. Zelensky never asked for any troops on, you know, on the ground, any boots on the ground. He's asking for better equipment and what's coming there is good, but they need more and they need better and they need it fast. I agree, by the way. Uh, uh, by the way, the video we just uh, put up was... Uh, uh, President Zelensky, uh, I don't know how old it is, but he it's, it's basically says, here I am in Ukraine. I'm not hiding. Uh, I'm going to stay in uh, Kiev until, you know, until the last blood, uh, something along those lines. Uh, but no, I, I agree. Uh, I think both Steve and, and Mike are saying the same thing. And, and my frustration, by the way, is, is uh, we have all this military hardware and we're seeing uh, a, a very aggressive move against Ukraine. There's several comments that we don't have any responsibility to defend Ukraine um, on our on our feet. Uh, but again, where does it stop? And my perspective is this. The way we left Afghanistan sent a great message to Putin that you can basically, you know, we're going to run away from the Taliban, let alone <laughs> Russia. So uh, we just need to supply Ukrainians with the best weaponry, uh, anti-aircraft missiles. Uh, unfortunately, they need training to be able to uh, fly our jets. And now we're getting uh, some older 
jets, uh, fighter jets from Poland in exchange. I, I don't know, by the way, maybe Congressman can uh, opine on that. Or do you have, um, do you know, you have knowledge of that deal where U.S. is supplying F-16s to Poland and F, uh, Poland is going to give some of the older SU-25s or SU-27s to... I'm, I, I'm not familiar with the details, but I can tell you this. We retired several hundred military aircraft last year, including A-10 tank killers, to the desert. <laughs> Perfectly good aircraft. Rather than being sure that uh, Ukraine, and while we're at it, Taiwan, uh, have the adequate uh, 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 equipment that they need uh, to, to confront... Uh, their uh, potential aggressors. Uh, that was urged on the Biden administration. It was ignored by the Biden administration. Uh, but, um, you know, a squadron yeah. of A-10s right now could do enormous good in ridding the world of that 40-mile column of, uh, of Soviet uh, equipment and supplies uh, 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 waiting to, to, to encircle Kiev. No, exactly. I, yeah, you're exactly right. We should be uh, putting a ton of arms in Taiwan right now uh, yeah. before China even thinks about uh, uh, headed, heading over there. Darius and, Stern, and, and, Stern. and particularly, one of my concerns is they are transferring aircraft that were earmarked for Taiwan to Ukraine. My point is the stuff we're sending out to the desert should be going to both of those countries. It shouldn't be sitting out in the desert. Great point, point, Steve. Yeah, Darius, you're really you, you are really proving my point, or at least agreeing with my point. See, in all reality, and I hate to say this, we've got their pastor on, uh, and I love the Ukrainian stand that the people have been taking. It's very passionate and respectable, honorable to the nth degree. But all of this work that we're talking about tonight should have been done three, four, five years ago. Okay, now it's very embarrassing. For all of Western Europe, including the United States, we're caught behind the eight ball. This is happening in real time, and we're scrambling around trying to decide if we can get him a few more airplanes. I mean, it, in all reality, it's embarrassing. And, and I think you're right, Darius. We should be thinking about Taiwan now so this same thing doesn't happen 18 months from now. Um, and so, you know, it's very important the steps that the United States takes because it could easily accelerate into World War III. Right now, we have a regional war. It sucks terribly, and I want to support the Ukraine to the maximum ability of our, of our ability to help them. But we cannot trigger. Putin, has, has, is, Putin is a madman, and it's very difficult when you're dealing with a madman. You have to take very concise, precise steps. That's what I'm advocating for. No. I don't want to trigger him. If a no-fly zone triggers him, there's a problem there. I mean, he, he, the, the Russian people have a problem in a war against Ukraine, the way they view Ukraine, but they don't have a problem with, in a war against the United States or a war against NATO. And we could, we could mobilize the whole country as opposed to let them stew and get somewhat defeated in Ukraine and find out that their economy's falling apart on them. 100%, Steve. I think one, one thing we need to do is also learn our lesson from this experience and from past experiences. We have to get energy independent. Look, I'm not against renewable energy. It takes time. You can't just follow a Green New Deal and all of a sudden kill those jobs and have an, it doesn't work that way. Oil is a fact out there. Look, I'm Persian. We love oil. So the fact of the matter is we, we should be putting a lot more leverage on any country, whether it's the OPEC countries that are going to mess with us now and try to get us engaged in their conflict, or it's going to be taking away Ru Russia's piece of the pie. That's where we can do real damage. And we are a huge oil producing country we just don't produce it and that's a shame no you mike i want to i want to uh, echo your uh, statements we have um some of the biggest reserves in the world uh but we don't uh use it uh matter of fact maybe congressman can uh, opine on that there uh, there was an article this morning about uh all these leases because uh some of the conversation over the weekend was that uh the administration uh ha uh has signed many leases this year, I mean, last year, and previous administrations have signed many leases with oil companies to drill. Uh, and, and the oil companies are refusing or haven't taken advantage of that. And then several oil company CEOs came out today and said, well, you know, uh, having a lease signed, you know, it takes years before we can get the first drop of oil out of the ground. Uh, what 
what what are your thoughts on that? And what can the Biden administration should they be doing today before besides Keystone to bring the gas prices? I mean, I have my own thoughts. Bringing gas prices down at the pump. Well, first and foremost, we've got six pending um, uh, requests for uh, permits uh, for new LNG export terminals to get American uh, natural gas uh, to Europe. Uh, the administration is slow walking all of those. Uh, the, um, uh, there was a refinery executive I saw interviewed just the other day on television saying all of the new EPA regulations that they just announced literally put us out of business. We can't continue to refine these fuels under these new EPA requirements. Uh, just because you have a lease uh, uh, on federal land, and again, don't forget this administration canceled all new leases on federal land. Just because you have a pre-existing lease doesn't mean it's gonna be producing oil. First of all, you've got to look for it. Secondly, you've got to find it. And then you've got to get the permits to actually drill for it. So, you know, when, the, when, when, when we saw Jen Psaki the other day saying, oh, there are 9,000 leases out there that are not producing, why don't they start producing those? That is completely disingenuous, and I believe she knows that. If she okay. doesn't, she's the most ignorant spokesman that we've ever had serving the United States, and that, uh, that's a pretty low bar. Got it. Thank you, Congressman. Steve? Yeah, I would like to ask the uh, congressman, you know, Darius, I know we're getting, uh, we're actually gone a little bit over the hour. The conversation has been fascinating from all angles. Congressman, I'd like to ask you, um, beyond just the Ukrainian situation, um, even prior to that, you know, we're struggling economically. We've got inflation kicking in, interest rates. Uh, you know, what, how, what do you perceive what's happening um, with the impacts of Ukraine on the already struggling American economy. Well, that's exactly the point. We were facing all of these problems before the uh, uh, invasion. Uh, all that's happened with the invasion, as far as the, is, is, is complicated the situation, but all of, of the policies that were put in place by this administration are having predictable results. We all learned in Econ 1, the, the, the classic definition of inflation, too many dollars chasing too few goods. This administration had already uh, uh, shut down productivity through all the lockdowns we've had uh, uh, in the blue states over the last several years. Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, paying people not to work, that, that reduced productivity dramatically. We've got about 2 million fewer Americans working today than we're working before the pandemic. At the same time, they flood the economy with trillions of dollars. Of course, you're going to have massive inflation. Well, but as I said, what really disturbs me from a national security standpoint is the question of our debt levels being so absurd uh, that if we are called upon to strain resources as we did uh, during World War II, well, like I said, we're already starting with a debt to GDP ratio higher right now than we had at the end of World War II when we'd gone through all of that. We have got to get our own house in order. This ought to be a wake up call. The world is getting much more unstable much more dangerous, uh, and we're not ready to prevail in such a world as we're now barreling into. Good points. A uh, couple of comments. Uh, actually, I have my own comment to that. We we put a, so much stimulus money out there that now we've got to raise the interest rates to curb the inflation that the excess stimulus money created, just like uh, you guys were all talking about. A uh, question from Inga is uh, uh, how prepared are we for additional cyber attacks? We know Russia is already engaged in cyber attacks against our country for probably years, maybe over a decade. Uh, how prepared are we uh, to, to, to protect our country and our businesses against cyber attacks, especially our infrastructure and some of our nuclear power plants uh, against Russian uh, cyber attacks? Because you know, we had, we had a very serious cyber attack uh, about a year or two ago. Um, by uh, a year ago, uh, Biden's response to that was to send the Russians a list of things that he asked them not to uh, attack. Mm -hmm. That's that's crazy. Um, the good news is we were expecting uh, crippling cyber attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure by the Russians. So far, we haven't seen much of that. So I, I guess the answer to your question is, 
until we see successful cyber attacks launched by Russia, I, I think we've got adequate defenses. Um, and the fact that they have failed so conspicuously to employ cyber warfare in Ukraine tells me maybe uh, they're not all they're cracked up to be. That's not to be complacent, but to suggest that, uh, uh, that, that, that perhaps our defenses are greater or their offenses are weaker uh, than we'd previously thought. I want to get to Reverend uh, his comments. I know Ukrainians are very bright uh, technologically. Uh, they know how to launch cyber attacks themselves. What are your thoughts uh, on Russian cyber attacks? And, and I know uh, Ukrainians are... Uh, are uh, you know, doing their own part to attack Russian infrastructure. Uh, what can you comment on, or what do you know about that? Well, it's it's that's interesting. Um, right now, in the diaspora here in Silicon Valley, a bunch of Ukrainians have come together, and they actually have to form private groups uh, to start uh, considering these attacks on Russia as a countermeasure. Um, they, if I have to say though, if you try to get a hold of the Ukrainian embassy here, you won't get through. All of their systems are down. So in the West, um, all of their internet, all of their uh, email, it's all down, uh, and that that's for sure. And if you don't believe me, put, make, give them a call tomorrow. Try to get through on the check out their uh, their uh, internet website. You'll see that. So so there have been some successful attacks by Russia, but certainly not on the scale that we would expect. There's also been a quick uh, forming of, uh, of a, uh, a cyber attack agency within Ukraine uh, to look at Russia. Now, you may be familiar, too, that Anonymous has acclaimed several attacks on Russia, too. And there is some evidence that that has been the case. There's been video evidence of broadcasts being made on the television of bombings uh, being done in, uh, in Ukraine right now. So we're seeing uh, Ukraine quickly coming up to speed with regard to that. We're also seeing a very lackluster uh, achievement on the part of the Russians with regard to coming after Ukrainian infrastructure. And certainly we know that Elon Musk has been very helpful with regard to getting the internet up and running there too. Yeah, that's great, exactly. A couple of things we're putting on the on, on the on the screen uh, before we wrap up. Uh, by the way, Congress, we, we do uh, one minute closing uh, statements by each of us. So before we go, we, I'm, we're going to start with you in, in, in a couple of minutes. So if you if you want to, there's a lot of folks that are frustrated. What can we do? A uh, couple of things. First, first of all, uh, you can write your congressman. Uh, on the screen, we have Cong Congressman mm -hmm. McCarthy. Costa, McClintock, Valadeo of the Valley, their email addresses. It will be on gbwire.com. So if you don't get a chance to put those down, uh, you can you can take it down and, and uh, I'll go to the website and, and email your congressman about your thoughts uh, uh, and what you, you believe U.S. government's involvement should be in this uh, war. Uh, and then number two, uh, locally here, uh, GV Granville Relief is uh, raising funds. So we're doing a $20,000 match to go to Mercy Corps, a U.S. nonprofit that uh, operates in 40 countries um, and, and including in uh, Ukraine uh, to uh, provide uh, relief uh, for uh, Ukrainian refugees. So, uh, again, we're doing a $20,000 match. It's been uh, very, very successful. That started uh, well, uh, yesterday. So with that, I'm going to go to closing uh, comments, uh, and we'll start with you, Congressman McClintock. One minute or less, please. Your thoughts on what's happening in Ukraine, Russia, and what should U.S. role be, uh, especially from your perspective uh, uh, and from this president going forward? Well, as I said earlier, this is a barbaric attack, unprovoked. Um, uh, it is a war crime. And ultimately, Putin and his henchmen need to be uh, held accountable to an international tribunal. That's going to require regime change in, uh, in uh, Russia. But if the heroism of the Ukrainian people continues and they're able to repel this invasion, I think that could happen in very short order. What can we do to help them repel that invasion? Number one, as I've been saying, we need to be sure that they have all of the uh, equipment, the uh, munitions. Uh, 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 that they need uh, to repel this invasion. Um, uh, and we need to be doing everything we can to collapse the, uh, the Russian economy. If we're able to do that, I believe the people of Ukraine will prevail uh, and um, we will avoid uh, a rapid global meltdown 
in the event of an entanglement of the United States with Russia, which we, we need to avoid. Thank you, Congressman. Reverend? Yes, I think that uh, the, the most critical thing to keep in mind is, as I said before, Zelensky is not asking for any troops. He's asking for equipment and they need it in fairly short order and they need a certain kind of equipment. Um, the skies need to be closed, but of course that's very confrontational. So it's understandable why the West doesn't want to get involved with that, but they can certainly make up for it by increasing their air uh, defenses and their air power. So that, that's what's critical at this point. You know, Ukraine is a peace loving nation. Never in its history has it ever invaded a neighboring country, never. And yet it's been invaded by probably half a dozen nations you know, just in the last 500 years, the Tatars, the Mongols, the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire, the Russians, the Nazis, all of these um, countries invaded Ukraine. And yet it, it's like an anvil that has withstood uh, many hammers and it will continue to do so. But we need the help of the West. I'm, I'm so sorry that it gave up its nukes in 94. Well, you know what, can, can I say something about that? Now, now Congress, uh, uh, McClintock mentioned too that it was not authorized by Congress, but you know what, if Ukraine went into this deal in good faith and there was this stipulation that they weren't aware of, then as far as I'm concerned, this was a fraud. This whole Budapest memorandum was, how are they supposed to know Look, that the it president, required that kind uh, of authorization? The president right? with an executive agreement cannot Create conditions where we are we, we are forced into a war. No, I, I'm, that, that I cannot I, be allowed. No, I, I, that's, I know. That's, I know that's that basic constitutional principle. And, 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 and I'm, I'm not arguing with that. I, I, I know. I studied my constitutional law too, uh, my, uh, Senator, but the or Congressman. But the the thing is, how is Ukraine supposed to know that when they signed? That that's it's it's a, it's, it's, just, it's a rhetorical question. But how how is Ukraine supposed to know about that detail? They signed in good faith. They expected the international community to defend them in good faith. They gave up their nuclear weapons, so they believed what they were told. And now we're saying, oh, sorry, it doesn't. It's it's it, we had no intention of keeping. Well, this. again, we are providing them with with all the equipment we can muster. Uh, I, I know. Uh, that's I know. been made very clear. We're doing what we can to collapse our economy. But you're suggesting we should be in a war with Russia. No, no, and not. And no. I'm telling you. No, well, I'm no, I'm not saying that. If we followed the letter of the agreement you just cited, that's exactly where we'd be right now. I know, um, I know. And that scares the hell out of me. No. Because, because again, you have to look at China. You have to look at Iran. You have to look at conditions around the world and what would happen if the United States were suddenly embroiled and engaged in a war with Russia. We're, they're not asking for that. They're not asking well, for that. that but you're, but you're the, asking the key for, is what are they going to do to defend bound, their sovereignty? If you're saying we are bound by the Budapest Agreement that Bill Clinton did on his own without any constitutional authorization, we'd be at war with Russia right now. No, and, I, and I mean, I'm not. I'm talking, yeah. I'm talking about the morality of creating what <laughs> appeared to be an agreement when in fact there was no legal backing to do so. That's what I'm I agree that was immoral of the, of the Clinton administration. So this is, is not I'm, the United I'm not States. talking about the legal question. I teach my business law students that there's law and there's morality and sometimes they intersect and sometimes they don't. Here well, we I've have a case argued. here we I've have a case argued. where law and morality did not intersect. The Ukrainians went into the Budapest memorandum in good faith. We didn't. I have never argued that Bill Clinton was a moral president. Look, we can we can blame President Clinton, but the fact of the matter is, to the Congress's point, if it's up to Congress, will Congress do the right thing and defend a democracy against a punk like Vladimir Putin? I get it. We've got to worry about the global picture. But like Steve said, we can blame Clinton, Obama, Bush, uh, Trump, Biden, whatever you want. But we're here now. What are we going to do? And, and I think that a lot of people on the ground are very passionate and we're, we have our American values, but I think we're also very frustrated, too. Well, when we throw hey. the word war around, we need to be very careful when dealing sure. with a nuclear power like Russia. And again, I would go back to those fundamental American principles. Only Congress can declare war. We only declare war when we are attacked. Uh, and when we declare war, we put everything that we have, the entire resource of the country behind it. When we were attacked at Pearl Harbor in 1941, uh, Franklin Roosevelt understood he had to go to the Congress to get permission to wage war. Uh, uh, because we had been attacked. And if you look at that resolution uh, declaring war on Japan, it pledged all of the resources of the country uh, to, the, uh, to the unconditional surrender of that government. We have not done that for 70 years. 
we fought these little sort of wars, putting our kids in harm's way and not backing them with the full resources of the country. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of people killed and not much to show for it. Uh, we need to go back to those principles. I, I feel that very, very strongly. And, and those principles are the most important when the world is most in peril. You mean principles of defending, when we say we go to war, we go to war aggressively. Is that what you're saying, Congressman? Yes, or, or yes, exactly right. We put everything we have into that war or we don't get into it to, 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 to begin with. If we're not prepared to put all of our resources behind our troops, we have no business sending them into harm's way. Yeah, but in 2003, we did that with Iraq and now we know it was maybe not the best intelligence and they didn't attack us, but why should the Ukrainian people suffer because now we're gonna change our standards? This is a democracy that is being attacked. Well, those, those, I, standards, those standards have done enormous damage to the United States and for that matter to the world. Sure. Uh, let's, let's go back to the principles yeah. that worked, the standards sure. that worked. Let's not repeat the mistakes we've made in the past. Fair enough. That's what they, I just don't understand why we don't learn from our mistakes in political science. We learn in the physical sciences. Whenever we make a discovery, we build on that discovery. In politics, we seem to make the same mistakes over and over again. I don't, I, I've never quite understood that, but there it is. Def Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, let's wrap up, uh, uh, Steve, and then Mike. Yeah, so I would like to take my final uh, minute in closing and remind us uh, what our very first president, George Washington, said. I think that's somebody that we, that both sides of the aisle can recognize um, as a great American leader. And he told us, he urged the American people not to get engaged directly. Do not get engaged in foreign entanglements if you can avoid them. And I think that that is still true today. And I think that that is solid philosophy that can stand the test of time. Uh, America becoming the world's policeman, uh, that's about a 30 to 40 year um, experiment in uh, futility. And so I think this is Western Europe's opportunity to rise to the occasion. And I think that we can help with as much assistance as we can get, but we have no business escalating this war. That will trigger World War III, which none of us want. Thank you, Steve. Mike? Yeah, I wanna thank our guests. Father Gregory, uh, You know, we had such a positive reaction when you were on last time. I'm so glad to see you here again. And then Congressman McClintock, thank you for being here. We're very much about facts and not spin and for people to be able to directly hear from you and your position makes a big difference for us at GB Wire. Thank you so much for that. Um, and it's been fun. I mean, I, I had a, a good time, you know, just trading ideas with you and that's, that's the way it should be because in the end, what is more important is not the letter behind our name, but the fact that we are Americans. Now, look, with, with all due respect to Ukraine, I truly believe this is the greatest country in the world. We have the greatest shared values in this melting pot, but it takes very hard work. It takes great long-term planning. And I think that like with what Steve was talking about, we probably haven't had the best long-term planning when it comes to Ukraine. And I certainly don't want the people of Ukraine to suffer because they are intelligent people. They are democratically minded folks and they are being oppressed by a common enemy. And so I, I sure as heck hope that we come together on a bipartisan basis and do the right thing. And I pray for our president, I pray for President Zelensky, but also for us here on the ground, the local communities to come together, send money to Ukraine. And thank you Granville for doing that. And to your family, Darius, for committing that money. Uh, my office is contributing to that as well as is Steve's. And um, we've got to make, we've got to get this done. We can make a difference in Ukraine. Let's get them the weapons they need and let's, let's support them. Uh, let's support a democratic nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh... My final comments, uh, again, also, I want to thank uh, Reverend uh, Zubac uh, and Congressman McClintock for joining us tonight at Robust Conversation. We will have both of you back on uh, soon, I hope. Uh, let me start by echoing uh, Mike's uh, uh, comments. Regardless of whether we're D or R, Democrat or Republican, we've got to come together. We've got to address inflation in our country, uh, which is going to hurt the middle class more than anybody else. We got to come up with solutions and quickly here first. Along with that, uh, we, we've got to get aid to Ukrainians as fast as possible. Time is of the essence. Two weeks from now, I'm gonna I'm gonna be upset if we're gonna say you know our thoughts and prayers are with family of President Zelensky because he got killed in the air raid in Kiev. And you know we try to get more Stinger missiles or or aircraft, but we didn't. Now he's gone. And now a puppet 
president is put in power by Putin and that now Ukraine is gonna become another pariah state that's gonna do cyber warfare against the Western uh, world, including the United States. And at that point we go, oh shit, we, we should have done a lot more so much earlier. So I wanna be upset if, if that happens. So regardless of whether we're Democrat, Republican, we need to urge Congress, we need to urge the president, number one, do everything you can to curb inflation in our, in our backyard. This is gonna hurt our economy substantially and, and increase production of oil. And yes, I'm talking to all my friends, environmentalists, uh, conservative, Republican, Democrats, until we find all the energy sources, renewable energy sources that make sense, we gotta get our energy independence. And the fastest way to that today is produce more oil and get off of Russian oil. And then again, I'm gonna re repeat myself, get, get, um, you know, get the aid to Ukraine as fast as possible. So we don't have to deal with a, a Ukraine that's a really a Russian state that's gonna increase, uh, wreak havoc on the Western world. And by the way, one of my co the comments I've got, I wanna say this, it's gonna be, it's gonna be controversial, but shame on our Congress in 1994 that didn't go to Ukrainians and say, you know what? President Clinton said that, doesn't mean crap. You know, he signed that treaty with you guys. Don't, that doesn't mean anything unless you was, uh, because Congressman McClintock is right. It has to be ratified by Congress. Uh, same thing with the Iran nuclear deal. It's not ratified by Congress. So, it, you know, any, any president can come and tear it up. So that's, uh, and, and really the Congress should have sent that message in 94 to the Ukrainians that, hey, before you give up all your nukes, 16, 1700 nuclear missiles. This thing doesn't mean a whole lot. Actually, it doesn't mean anything. And I'm gonna end with that. Well, you know, and, and a lot of contracts say this contract is subject to approval. That should have appeared in the Budapest memorandum. They should have said that this is subject to approval of the US Congress. Yeah. And that yeah. was a clause missing from there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Can I, can, I, can I read a poem to you guys? Just We're gonna end with your poem. Uh, and but before you say that, on behalf of all of us at GV Wire and my co-host Steve and Mike and my and our guest tonight, uh, thank you for watching and have a great week. We'll see you next week on, a, on with another fantastic show. Um, hopefully Tuesday night. We're still debating what night this show is going to be on uh, going forward. But uh, Reverend, you, you get the last word. Sure. Just everybody, just listen for a second. When Ukraine fought for life, battling her hangmen, living and dying and waiting in vain for some signs of compassion, Europe was silent. When Ukraine in unfairly weighed battles drained of blood, drenched in tears, looked to friends for survival, Europe was silent. When gripped in chains and brute force, Ukraine was enslaved, not a master of the land that she tilled, when her cries even stirred the immutable cliffs, Europe was silent. When Ukraine reaped a harvest of sorrow for her Lord executioner, herself dying of hunger and unable to speak, Europe was silent. When Ukraine was accursed and replaced with mass graves, when the demon himself had shed tears for her plight, Europe was silent. Do you know when that poem was written? You wanna guess? 1931, almost a hundred years ago. This has just been the plight of the Ukrainian nation throughout history. It's a sense of being attacked, invaded, and not helped by the world. And that's why I wanted to share that poem with you, just to understand that the suffering of the Ukrainian people is not new. It's in the DNA of the history of this particular nation. So I uh, wanted to share that with you. And it's not so much even the poem, but it's when it was written, 1931. Reverend, if you can uh, email that to us, we'll post that on gvwire.com. Sure, that's written by Alexander Olis. Okay, just uh, email that uh, to us and we'll, we'll get it up. Sure. Thank you and good night.